webinar. Yes, I do want to let you know that we are recording this webinar um, and we will have it posted to our website after. A few housekeeping things. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the question and answer section. Put them in as you think of them. Don't wait until the end to put them in. Um, that way, at the end, we can go back and we will have captured your um, questions that you had during that time. I know sometimes if I do that, I, I forget uh, what I was even going to ask. So please do that. The um, chat is only reserved or if you're having some kind of technical issue that you would like to uh, ask a question about. Um, we are still waiting on one of our panelists, but we're gonna go ahead and get started today. Um, and that's, that's about it. I want to introduce to you, first of all, Robin Jones. She is the project director at the Great Lakes ADA Center. Um, she is the center's principal investigator and project director. Robin has served as the director of the center since its inception in 1991. The Great Lakes Center is one of 10 regional federally funded technical assistance centers on the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. The center serves the states of Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. In addition, she serves as um, uh, co -P what is COPL, Robin, you can explain that, on the federally funded ADA uh, PARC project, a research collaborative that examines the uh, factors that influence the participation of people with disabilities in the communities. Robin currently serves as a member of the Disability Advisory Committee for the Disability I am Chicagoland affiliate and a member of the advisory board for the National Organization of Nurses with Disabilities. She is a member of the Chicago Botanical Garden Community Advisory Committee and serves on the AOD Disability Employment TA Center, which is called DTAC, advisory work group. Robin was appointed by Governor Pritzker to the Illinois Access and Functional Needs Advisory Committee. And I'm gonna turn it over now to you, Robin, thanks. Great, thank you. Are you able to see my, are you seeing my full slide or are you seeing the presenter view? I can't tell which one you're seeing. I'm seeing your full slide. Okay, great, thank you. I just wanna make sure. <laughs> um, thank you for the introduction. And um, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about reasonable accommodation and kind of cover some of the most commonly asked questions that we get from employers. Um, as the Great Lake ADA Center, we respond to questions posed by employers, but also by applicants and employees. And this just represents some of the most common ones that they have related to reasonable accommodation. So first, how do I know who is a person with a disability under the ADA? As we know, there are multiple different definitions of disability that are used, um, depending on what you're talking about. You have a different definition of disability for accessible parking. You have a different definition of disability for eligibility for Social Security. You may have a long-term or short-term disability policy that you offer your employees that's going to also have its own definition of what constitutes a disability. But under the ADA, we have a very specific definition of disability, and it's three-pronged as far as coverage goes. First is an individual with a physical or psychological impairment that substantially limits them in one or more major life activities. This includes people who have episodic conditions, may not always be present, the limitation, who might have abnormal cell growth like cancer, et cetera, or limitations in bodily functions, let's say celiac disease or migraines or something of that nature. It also includes individuals that may um, not have a permanent disability, but are substantially limiting for a period of time, such as long haul COVID. It does not cover somebody who has a transient condition, such as a broken leg, or et cetera. However, if let's say um, that person's uh, broken leg uh, experienced some complications and wasn't healing correctly, and they had longer than was expected recovery period, they would be covered by a, the ADA because it wasn't then a transient condition because of those complications. 
I'm also covered and protected against discrimination on the basis of disability because of a record of having an impairment. This means in my past, I may have had a drug or alcohol abuse related issue. I'm no longer using, but I have it in my past. I may have had a cancer history and there may be some reluctance on the part of an employer to hire somebody who has those kinds of histories. This would be discriminatory um, under the ADA. The third prong of coverage under the ADA is individuals who are regarded as having a disability. So this is an individual with or without a disability who has a negative action taken against them because of something that is based on a stereotype or that the um, entity just makes an assumption about. So I'll give you some examples. Let's say you have somebody who's obese. Obesity itself has not yet been found to be a disability under the ADA. There have been a couple of the courts that have ruled obesity as a disability, but not universally across all of the sectors and the EEOC. However, there might be a underlying medical condition that that person has that causes the obesity that would be covered under the ADA. But let's say we, and we've all seen the 48 hours or the 60 minutes shows where you take two people, identically qualified, same resume. They both go to apply for a job and who gets hired? 95% of the time, it's the person who's not obese because we have a stereotype about what somebody would be who's obese can or cannot do. That would be a regarded as claim under the ADA. Let's say I am somebody with a physical disability. I use a mobility device on a periodic basis. Um, the employer sees me using that mobility device and makes an assumption about what I can and cannot do makes an assumption that I cannot stand, makes an assumption I cannot walk a few steps, et cetera. So they may take a negative action against maybe hiring me, promoting me, et cetera, based on what they assume or they are applying as a stereotype because I'm a user of a mobility device. That would also be a regarded as claim under the ADA. This is the areas that we see the fastest growing area of complaints being filed under the ADA is this third prong, the regarded as. To clarify, however, the only group that is eligible for an actual accommodation under the ADA is that first prong, which is the individual who actually has a physical or psychological impairment, limiting them in one or more major life activities. The other two prongs are protected against discrimination based on disability, but because they don't actually have a disability, in that case, um, that would not be needing to be accommodated and eligible for accommodation. Second. Do I have to hire someone with a disability if they apply for my job? The answer is the ADA is not an affirmative action statute. So you're not required to hire the person with a disability just because they have a disability. You're required to look at the most qualified individual. What you have to be careful about is that you're not disqualifying somebody because they have a disability and or making assumptions that mm, it's going to cost me more to hire this person because they have a disability and they need a reasonable accommodation. That would not be a justifiable reason for not hiring somebody with a disability who is the most qualified candidate. Again, you cannot disqualify just because I need accommodation. Third, can I ask someone to tell me about their disability? What questions can I ask? The general prohibition is that an employer cannot ask about a disability in the application process, nor in the interview process. The focus should not be on the disability and you should not be asking questions about the disability. You can focus your questions on the job tasks and how that the individual would perform them. So for example, if somebody comes to the interview and they are using sign language as part of the interview, it would be fine for you to have questions as it would relate to them doing the tasks that may involve speech or oral communication. That would be legitimate because it was tied to the job itself. If someone identifies that they need an accommodation to do the job and you believe that they are qualified to do that job, if the accommodation was provided, you can extend a conditional offer of employment and explore the accommodation during this phase. It's known as the conditional offer of employment phase. This is where you have that employee identified and you're not quite sure whether you're gonna be able to provide the accommodation or not, but you're gonna use this period of time to explore, maybe it's the cost of the accommodation, maybe it's the impact that the accommodation would have on the workplace itself, but this conditional offer of employment phase is allowed. If you are gonna withdraw the offer of employment, 
you have to base that on factual information, such as that the accommodation is not reasonable. So you've done the exploration. The cost is going to be exceed what you're able to provide. You've taken in consideration things like tax credits, et cetera, still not able to provide. Or that the accommodation, that, um, that even with the accommodation, the person is still not qualified to do the job. Then I can withdraw that offer of employment at this phase. But it has to be a reason that I can justify and defend. Do I have to provide everything that an employer or an applicant asks for? We get this asked a lot. You're only required to provide what is reasonable. Your accommodation must be effective. It must work. It must meet the need. And you're not required to provide somebody's preferred accommodation. They may have something that they prefer. Let's say that person is asking for a flexible work schedule um, and they want to be able to leave early um, on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays in order to attend some appointments or something. Maybe due to the position that that person holds, their supervisory responsibilities, et cetera, the operations of the organization, that time period does not work for that, for you in the organization. You don't stop at that point. You have that interactive process with the individual to discuss what might work. Are there other alternative times or alternatives in relationship to how you could still accommodate that person, um, but have it still work within the context of the position and your needs as an employer? So the person may have something they prefer, but they need to be working with you as an employer to identify what will work. You need to match the requested accommodation with work-related limitation. So for example, you're not required to provide personal services or personal equipment. I'm not required to provide toileting assistance. I'm not required to provide feeding or um, nutrition to um, somebody. I'm not required to administer medications for somebody. I may need to accommodate them in the use of these particular things. So for example, if somebody has a personal care attendant that might be coming in to assist them with toileting, I may need to adjust their schedule to allow for them to have that break time at a certain time when somebody could come in to be able to provide that assistance. Or somebody may need to refrigerate their medications. I may need to accommodate them by providing them with a refrigerator for their medications. They're not responsible for the medication itself, for administering it, but I'm accommodating their use of the medications. Number five, do I set precedence by providing an accommodation for an employee? No, reasonable accommodation is a case-by-case -case basis. So the fact that I accommodate one person with one particular type of accommodation does not automatically mean that the next person who asks for that same accommodation is going to receive it. It's all about time, place, and context. So there isn't a precedence per se um, that is set by providing one person an accommodation over another. Each case should be looked at case by case, and it's a, it's a, it's the point in time. Let's say at one point in time, I'm fully staffed and I'm able to provide a flexible work schedule for somebody. The next time the next person makes that request, we're down three staff people. I'm not able to provide that same flexibility because of what's happening operationally in the organization. So again, it's all about context and time. Establish procedures for requesting accommodations. Make sure you have a process in place, who, what, and where. And establish a timely process for reviewing your requests for accommodations. Who is going to review it? Is there a panel? If I have a question, do I have a, a mediation process where somebody can actually appeal um, the decision that's being made? What is the process that I have in place? And how is that articulated to my employees? How is that articulated to my supervisors and my managers? and educate everybody so that they know what that process is and how it would apply to them. Number six, I'm afraid to hire someone with a disability because they will most likely sue me at some point. How do I protect myself? This is something that comes up all the time. Employers telling us that they are fearful of hiring somebody with a disability because what if it goes wrong and they get sued? Well, the reality is we are a litigious society. People with and without disabilities potentially could sue you as an employer at any time. So to look at people with disabilities as being more of a risk than somebody without a disability would be the wrong approach to take. All employees are a potential what if when it comes to litigation. Keep that in mind. 
If you follow your appropriate policies and procedures when you're considering a reasonable accommodation and document your efforts, you will have a defense in regards to whether or not you have denied an accommodation or there's an issue that arises with an accommodation with an employee or an applicant. Make sure you create a workplace environment that reinforces non-discrimination based on disability and look to embrace disability as part of your overall diversity pro program. Too often when we look at DEI efforts, et cetera, accessibility and disability are left off or they're treated as a other. Oh yeah, we have you know, um, all of these uh, LGBTQ plus and we have you know, racial diversity, et cetera. Oh yeah, right, mm, we need to include disability. No, it should be part of all of your efforts and your employees and others should see that that is part of your messaging, et cetera, that you're doing. That's how you establish an environment where everybody feels comfortable and it will greatly reduce your potential for litigation because the employees are going to feel like you as an employer care about them and that you are interested in what their needs are and that they are successful in doing their job. Seven, do I have to pay someone with a disability if they took a two hour break? Individuals with disabilities are subject to the same criteria as individuals without disabilities as it relates to pay and the use of time or paid time. So as an employer, I have a responsibility to potentially look at whether or not somebody is working or not working and whether or not I'm providing an accommodation is separate from what I'm going to pay them. You are only required to pay someone for work that they actually perform. If you are providing somebody an altered work schedule, such as a six hour day instead of an eight hour day, you're only going to provide them, pay them for six hours. If you are accommodating somebody who's going to be in the office place for eight hours, but they have got two hours of breaks built into that, you would only be required to pay them for what you are required under law and OSHA, et cetera, as it relates to break time and any additional time that that person might take, that would not be time that you would have to pay. So you as an employer would have to look at that particular issue. Yes, you might have somebody who's in the office for eight hours, but our accommodation is that they're getting rest periods during the day, et cetera, that exceeds the 30 hours, 30 minutes for lunch and the 15 minutes in the morning and the afternoon that are required under certain workplace laws then I would look at, I may only be paying that person six hours or six and a half hours of pay during the day. Also consider that they may use other benefits to address leave for disability related issues, such as Family Medical Leave Act, use of their vacation or sick time or unpaid leave. The ADA requires that an employer allow and have policies in place that allow individuals to use their accrued leave as part of their potential accommodations under the ADA, as leave is a recognized accommodation under the ADA. Whether it's paid for is based on your policies and procedures in their use of um, PTO time, um, et cetera, and their eligibility for that. Eight. What can I tell other employees when they ask me why someone got a special piece of equipment or time off? You cannot disclose a disability of an employee to other employees. You are required to maintain confidentiality. That's for all employees, whether it's a disability or not, whether I'm taking time to go to a medical appointment, et cetera. All that information that's medical in nature needs to be kept confidential and only accessed by those who would need to know. So that's key and important to understand. So it would not be appropriate to inform my employees that I'm accommodating somebody because of their stroke or because of their whatever um, mental health condition, et cetera. I can inform my employees that I'm complying with local, state, and federal laws as well as provide disability awareness training and educate everyone about the reasonable accommodation process. If an employee approaches you related to an issue about an accommodation that another employee may have, if they believe that they need that same accommodation, you can direct them to your policies, practices, and procedures for requesting an accommodation, and it can be reviewed just like any request for an accommodation would be reviewed by anybody who might be eligible. Nine. How do I pay for accommodations? One of the number one questions that we get, cost. Paying for accommodations is the responsibility of the employer. The employer is responsible to bear the costs of accommodations. You cannot ask an employee to bring their own equipment or to provide their own accommodations. Again, you're only required to provide accommodations that are reasonable. There could be an administrative or a financial hardship, for example, 
somebody asking for a flexible work schedule that doesn't, your normally opening hours are 8 a.m. And this person's position is a customer service position that would start greeting clients at 8 a.m. But they're asking for a flexible work schedule to not come in till nine. That may be an administrative hardship because you would not be required to change your hours of operation as an accommodation for somebody. So that could be an administrative hardship. Financial hardship is based on dollars. That's going to be an individual assessment based on what your resources are and what the cost of the individual accommodation is that that person may need and your ability to look at what your options are for paying for those particular accommodations. You need to consider the impact of tax credits and tax deductions. There is IRS Code 190, which is an architectural barrier removal tax deduction, also covers transportation. This does not limit it by the size of the company and is a maximum of $15,000 per year. This could be used for restriping a parking lot for parking spaces, could be used for putting a lift on a company vehicle or putting hand controls on a company vehicle for somebody for widening a door, for remodeling a bathroom to create an accessible toilet, putting an automatic door opener on, something of that nature. Those would all fall as costs under architectural barrier removal tax deduction. IRS Code 44 is a disabled tax credit. It's a maximum of $5,000 a year. It's only available to small employers defined by the IRS as 30 or fewer employees or $1 million or less in gross revenues. This works by um, basically a 50% rule. For every dollar you spend, 50% of that you can take as a tax credit. And my last one, number 10, how do I discipline somebody with a disability? Can I fire them? This is often a question we're asked. People are, again, goes back to that fear of hiring somebody with a disability for the fact that you may not be able to get to fire them or get rid of them. So under the ADA, somebody with a disability is held to the same workplace standards of conduct and performance as somebody without a disability. So if you have an employee who's not performing and you have documentation as you would for any employee who's not performing their job, then you would be able to let somebody go. Now, is this going to be that this person's not going to file a complaint against you? I can't tell you that. Again, goes back to my comments before, we're a litigious society. But people without disabilities that you fire also could potentially suing you for something that they feel they may be suing you for age discrimination or um, gender discrimination or something else. So again, litigious society, make sure that you have your documentation in place and that your decision is one that's sound and that you are able to back up. If they identify as a disability, as a reason for the poor performance, when you're engaged in some kind of, um, you know, disciplinary process, then you really need to make sure um, that you have given them an opportunity to look at reasonable accommodation to see if there's any accommodation that will allow them to perform their job. And I always like to remind people that the fact that the excuse of my disability made me do it is not a defense. You as an employer are not required to tolerate abusive behaviors. You're not required to tolerate um, uh, um, insubordination um, or anything of that nature. Um, just because somebody says, well, you know, my, my disability made me do it. Due to my disability, you know, I'm, I'm unable to follow, to follow directions. Due to my disability, I'm this or what that. Again, there might be a need to look at accommodations. Maybe somebody needs written instructions instead of verbal instructions. So we look at those kinds of things as how we can uh, address or improve their performance. Um, but again, my disability made me do it is not going to be a defense under the law. And I have the same rights to um, discipline an employee with a disability as I would an employee without a disability. So if you have questions, um, well, I know we'll have at the end of the session today, but also you can always contact the Great Lakes ADA Center. We have an 800 number. It's available from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. We have an email address, adagreatlakes at uic.edu. And we have a website that has a wealth of information on it and documents and resources as well. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it back to um, you, Shelley. Thanks, Robin. If you don't mind, there is one question uh, that was in the question and answer that I would like for Tara to read to you. Um, if you don't mind, and let's go ahead and answer that right now. Yes, Robin, we are finding that employers are asking applicants if they have a disability on the application. How do we how do you recommend answering that? 
Well, first and foremost, it's illegal for them to ask a question. They, the only legal question really for somebody to ask is, um, would you require a reasonable accommodation? Um, uh, are you able to do this job, perform the essential function of this job with or without a reasonable accommodation? Yes or no. And answering yes doesn't tell you I have a disability or, and so it just says I can do the job with or without accommodation. Answering no would tell me that I can't do the job even with an accommodation, which would make me unqualified. So that's a permissible question, but anything other than that would be a, would be a illegal question. So we, you know, this is really an individual thing for people to have to decide um, on an application. We have seen and and talked to people about different responses or strategies to do this. One might be just writing, I'll discuss this further in the interview. Um, one would be not answering at all. I, you know, this, this is an illegal question um, or whatever, but we also know that those kinds of responses have consequences at times in that you could have an employer who just, you know, pushes aside your application, um, et cetera. We also would strongly advise, and we've been working closely with the Chicago um, Regional EEOC office when we are seeing applications that have these kinds of things on them, we are bringing them to the attention of the EEOC office and they are actually reaching out to these employers and talking to them about them before they're not filing a complaint against them, but they're making them aware of the fact that this is an illegal question and they're basically giving them a cease and desist kind of um, opportunity to discontinue. So um, if you're interested and you have particular um, applications like that, please contact us because we have been working very closely with the EOC here in the regional office on this particular issue. Um, Robin, one commenter says on the application, companies do it as part of their affirmative action program. Affirmative action is asking whether I have a disability or not, and that is totally separate and cannot be identifiable in regards to um, relationship to my application. So an employer who's got an affirmative action uh, program can have a separate form that is optional for me to fill out but it does not have identifier information. It's to be able to collect, did I recruit? And this is like, okay, so you've got a lot of employers under section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act, which is the um, piece that says anyone who receives a federal contract of $25,000 or more must have an attainment goal for people with disabilities of 7% or higher. Um, and they have to document any efforts that they have to recruit and or hire people with disabilities, including what their applicant pool looks like. So they are required to collect this information. But again, that information is supposed to be separate from the application itself. It should not be on the application. It should be a separate form that does not have identifier information so that they could be able to say, I had X number of applicants, 10 of them identified as having a disability, not Susie identified as having a disability or Sam identified as having a disability. That's illegal. So they're illegally collecting that information and may be misunderstanding the requirements if they are subject to Section 503. Okay, thank you very much, Robin. I appreciate your presentation. Next, we're going to uh, move on to Stephanie Light. She is currently employed with the state of Illinois as a business employment consultant, certified business engagement professional with the Department of Human Services, Division of Rehabilitation Services. She works with Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act partners and businesses to increase awareness for people with disabilities in the workforce. She's been with the agency for 23 years in total. She is also an instructional assistant professor at Illinois State University, where she teaches American Sign Language courses for deaf and hard of hearing special education majors. During summer seasons, she teaches American Sign Language to speak pathologists, audiologists, and families that have children with hearing loss. Stephanie holds a Bachelor of Arts in Speech Communication with California State University, Northridge, and a Master's Degree in Special Education with an emphasis on Deaf Education from Illinois State University. Stephanie is a certified wind, uh, windmills trainer, and she is also a certified business engagement professional. Stephanie, I'll, Stephanie, I'll turn it over to you, um, and I'll ask you to give a, a visual description and your pronouns, please, before you start. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. I am a female Caucasian with brown wavy hair um, highlighted. I'm having glasses and a black shirt. 
with red glasses. I'm using a sign language interpreter as my voice right now. My presentation is about people with disabilities and how they can bring their diverse skills to the workforce. I am thrilled to be a part of this event, and it's so wonderful to see so many people in attendance. Thank you to Silk for inviting me to be a part of this presentation. We don't have a sign language interpreter on camera. Sabrina? Sorry, Stephanie. Can you see my slide? I just want to make sure that those were able to be shared. Okay, next slide, please. We are the best kept secret in the entire state, our state work. We work with individuals with disabilities, making um, decisions and choices with education and employment decisions. We are funded 80% federally and 20% state. We are the leading agency that works with individuals who have disabilities that come into our office for assistance with employment. We have a diverse range of services that are provided to our consumers. And we have things like counseling, referrals, training, restorative services, as well as placement. Next slide, please. We help people with disabilities try to find and maintain their employment. Our goal is to help our consumers find qualified employment that can pay a living wage and offers a chance for advancement. Our VR counselors have an initial interview with our consumers to first find out what the barriers may be to employment. We try to address them as they become our consumers. We want them to be successful on the job. And once the placement and competitive um, wages is happening, we want that to continue. As you can tell, we have offices all throughout the state of Illinois. You can use our DHS office locator on our website, which is dhs.state.il.us, and you can look for a local office there, and you can go ahead and call our toll-free number, which is 877-581-3690. And if you have any general questions about DRS, you can always email us at dhs.drs at It's dhs.drs at Illinois spelled out dot gov. We currently have 46 offices and it's in 102 different counties. We have five different regions. Next slide, please. The value that we have and we place on helping the individuals and their desire to bring to the businesses, we want any way that we can to try and provide employment solutions. We have a dual client approach, which means we want you to be our consumers as well. We want to make sure that we have these customers and that they are good candidates so we can work with the businesses on that to make sure that our goals and our mission is to help individuals who have disabilities obtain and maintain this competitive integrated employment. We work closely with customers who qualify and have the skills. We want to incorporate all of that and have inclusion, diversity, equal opportunity, accessibility, and responsiveness to our customers, to our stakeholders, to our employers, to our partners, and the list can go on from there. Next slide, please. If you know of anyone who may be interested in becoming um, one of our DRS customers and receiving services, that starts with a referral process. A counselor would be assigned to you, and we can then start that process. We will identify what the needs are, and we will work closely with you throughout that process. 
We want to make sure that you are as successful as you can in addressing all of your needs. You can visit our website. You can have a family member, a caregiver, or any service provider, or yourself can make the referral. The customers will then meet with a VR counselor, a vocational rehab counselor, and see if they are eligible for which services we have. And the counselor may ask the customer to bring in certain documentation of their disability. If they do not have that, then DRS can request that information to be sent to a medical professional and DRS can pay for that services. So we can then provide that documentation of disability. And after the referral process, um, we can then get into the services. Next slide, please. Can you go back one, Shelly or Tara? Thank you. We serve all different individuals' disabilities, as you can see from the list of with reality. We have some examples of the ones that we have worked one-on-one -on -one with. We cannot have a whole um, extensive list on one page. It'd be too many bullet points, but if you have a documented disability from your physician, more than likely you will be qualified for our services. And those services are needed to be looked at how it can, um, it all depends on what your disability provides um, and what barriers you might face. Next slide, please. We work with individuals from age 16 to 64. We also offer specialized VR services for individuals who are blind or visually impaired, deaf and hard of hearing, Spanish speaking, Latino with a disability, as well as high school students who have a disability. We can help them plan for their future. And as they're a high school graduate, they would then transition in a STEP program. And we also have work incentive programs and plans to assist individuals who are receiving any Social Security income or Social Security Disability Income, SSI, SSDI. And while they're working, they will make sure to know what that work can affect their benefits. We explain that. We have a program called um, SCP, which is Severe, um, severe Employment. And we have people who may need ongoing support to be successful in SCP, and we provide that with like job coaches or job training. Next slide, please. For the initial interview, it can take place once the counselor reviews the referral. They will look over that application, and the counselor will then be assigned to your case and will likely contact you to make an appointment. To learn more about who you are and what barriers you are facing and what you've experienced in terms of employment, after you've become a customer of our agency, the counselor and you will sit down and write something called an IPE. It is an individualized plan for employment. That will then be documented on what type of services will be received from DRS and who is paying for which service and what type of services are required for you to be successful in your job. Next slide, please. The workplace diversity is something that's very vital. It is the strength in our company because really it introduces new ideas and new practices to businesses as well as um, diverse workplaces can provide and improve company identity and also um, imagination and envisions, and also it's really important to see how it can allow individuals with different backgrounds and experiences to work together to then solve problems and to make advances in the workplace. The diversity is something that helps broaden the focus of the workplace and introduces the innovative ideas and practices to the company. Here are a few benefits. So we have creativity, culture, company reputation, and also overcoming challenges. So for that to happen, you must have a diverse team and a diverse workplace that includes 
having individuals into policy, being innovative with resource groups, as well as mentorship programs, and providing a diverse training. You can then have creative culture and working closely with the workplace to then celebrate the differences in individuals. And then people will have access to that company's policy and see how each employee's relationship to the employer is unique and can promote engagement. And you can address implicit bias. Next slide, please. Disability inclusion, it takes dedication and creativity in an environment where each individual, regardless of their ability, can feel valued, they can feel respected, and they can enjoy equal access to any opportunity in the workplace. The key goal is to really strategize ways in which the world can see individuals each have their own way to lead their life fully with positive attitudes and with possibilities and feeling of being able to do so many things. Empowering the individual will break society bar societal burials, barriers and really help make change. Organizations and other communities must actively challenge the current processes and policies that are not serving individuals with disabilities for the wider community. So advocates become the voice in that demand and not only in the recognition, but also in the concrete action and by raising awareness in the challenges that we're facing many individuals' disabilities, we can then see how the advocating can contribute to erasing stigma and misunderstanding, and they can then have a collaborative effort to journey towards goals where there is change and that there's disability inclusion in the workplace, and we can have a collective effort from every individual and every organization in the community. So that way there can be sustainability and empowering individuals with disabilities to then promote this inclusivity. Next slide, please. DRS business unit, currently we are called the, biz, the Better Business Bureau or the Business Bureau. And it's a unit where employment engagement is creative and working with how businesses can work with the community members to identify the skills that are needed and the individual with disabilities is able to be a part of that networking event with the business. We also have other ways to expand our competitive employment opportunities for individuals who have disabilities, as well as facilitate and maintaining this work um, partnership. You, as the business, and as our customer as well, can work towards the goal. We are working with businesses and we are working with the field offices. We are kind of like the middle means to both worlds. Next slide, please. For employers today, it seems to be a need for partnership to understand and be with the ones who need to thrive for skill-based employment and the individual who has disabilities can then achieve their goals and reduce the barriers in finding employment by having this workforce development. Throughout the years, DRS has built a statewide network of hiring and partnering with businesses who do enjoy to hire individuals with disabilities and work with the training. The role of the creative partnership is to maintain that the placement of our customers is with the right business. We are here to help advocate and support skills and also provide employers and customers that bridge to services. And we are behind the scenes working to build on this partnership that presents careers and presents longevity in jobs and gives skill match to the employees, to the employer. And our team members work within the unit and I can see that there could be a candidate who's interested in employment on the company's need 
and we can work with them. We try to say, if you can imagine it like a matchmaker, they share with us what they're looking for. The employer tells us what their candidate, perfect candidate would look like and who they want to hire for their business. And then we provide them the right candidate to match that description. So they are a creative, loyal partner that continues to come back looking for our guidance in our services and the resources that we provide for their future. And we negotiate and work closely with a diverse company from small businesses to larger ones in corporate America. And we work in between. For example, there's different internships, different industries, janitorial, retail, IT, factory work, social services, education, the list varies. And we identify if it's a full-time need or a part-time need, maybe it starts as an internship or apprenticeship. That is something that we work with to include in our unit. Next slide, please. As you can see, we have many services that we can offer to the businesses. We have pre-employment, accommodations, training, financial support, universal design, diverse programs. You are a consumer as well, and we are able to work with you and see what your needs are. It's not only uh, transaction. It's not just transactional. We actually have a rapport and a relationship to meet your needs. And you can come see us at any time if there's a need so we can work together. Next slide, please. As you can see, our collaborate, uh, collaborative partners with WIOA, this is um, the Illinois Department of Human Services, Illinois Department of Employment Security, Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, the Illinois Community College Board, Career Link, Adult Education Programs, and local social service agencies and organizations. And they collaborate with us to then continue to have success. And LOIA is under WIOA, and that's with the Workforce Incentive Program, Incentive Act. You may have heard of LIOA, and that's for local um, employment, and you can check in your area for that endorsement. We collaborate with business. We have business meetings throughout the year, and we collaborate closely to then make sure that we are helping our customers. That's always the key. Next slide, please. And while working with our businesses, that hire our customers, we can then provide different types of benefits that um, the employer can take advantage of, like hiring a person with disability may provide, um, you know, we want to make sure that there could be positive um, understandings. There's one in four disabled individuals, and it's really important for them to be a part, to be able to be in this integrated workforce development. It helps with the workforce diversity and employment. When you're thinking about working with an employer with disabilities, some employers may feel resistant and a reservation to hiring individuals due to cost and what the job accommodations may include. If this is a concern, it could be, you know, largely unfounded because there are many resources and there's many organizations out there that can help individuals understand the benefit and reduce that fear. Next slide, please. We'd love to see our customers be successful and succeed and have this on off work experience and to see the outcomes of our customers in placement of employment. You should check out our success stories on our website. Next slide, please. I need to give credit where it's due. This is the data and the statistics from the Office of Employment Disability Policy. I have collected this information to add here. These percentages show um, individuals with disabilities, people involved in the workforce, and with employment, there's a lot of reasons why um, 
you should hire a person with disabilities. They are great for business. A few reasons. It reduces turnover. There's improved company morale and culture. You can expand your consumer marketing. And you can meet a federal contract requirement under Section 503 with the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And it can also improve your company's bottom line. Really, the dedication and the loyal workplace that they can provide. Next slide, please. Nationally, disability, National Disability Employment Awareness Month, NDEAM, happens every year, and it will be happening in the month of October, October 1st through 31st. So the theme for this 2024 is Access to Good Jobs for All. NDEAM is a month-long celebration that really shows how it can, any individual with a disability can be added as a positive employment employee to your business and will want to raise awareness about disabilities in all issues and foster this culture of inclusion and see that there are many different ways that we can celebrate Disability Employment Month in October. And I hope to see everyone here celebrating in one way or another. Next slide, please. Here are some resources that are available if you're interested. Many of these resources and organizations are out there to help you with the process of hiring an individual with disability based on your workforce. Thank you for having me here today. I'm going to turn it back over to Shelly. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Appreciate the presentation. Our next speaker has had a, a terrible morning <laughs> with technical difficulties with her computer. So uh, she overcame those difficulties by uh, phoning in. So she's not going to be appearing on the screen. So uh, Carrie, after I read your, um, your biography, if you will give a, a, a visible description of yourself so uh, people have that in their mind as you're speaking. So Carrie has been a disability advocate since 1996, graduating from Loyola University, Chicago with a BS in psychology and a master's in education specialist degree in school psychology. She started her career as a school psychologist, where after only two years, she became legally blind from a hereditary condition that forced her to leave the field in search of rehabilitation services and gainful employment. Now, as someone with a disability, her three-year-old, her three-year journey led her to a Chicago-based social service agency serving adults with vision loss, where she acted as their education coordinator and director of services for eight years. Laid off during the recession, she decided to start her own disability consulting business, working with large international companies as well as solopreneurs. After she closed her company, and COVID subsided, Carrie took a job at the public aid office for the state of Illinois, then transitioned to the Department of Rehabilitation Services, where she uh, is in her current position. Um, when not working, Carrie is a photographer and an active volunteer for social justice initiatives. Okay, Carrie, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Okay, thanks, Shelly. Um, and I apologize to everyone that I couldn't be there um, kind of in person, uh, but um, to describe myself, I am a white female, uh, straight, brownish hair. Um, I have black glasses and uh, that's about it. <laughs> okay, um, thank you again. And um, today what I would like to do is speak um, to everyone as a person with a disability that had, um, you know, been looking for a job, but then also started my own consulting business, helping other people um, in businesses understand how they could tap into the disability market. Um, my uh, overall goal actually was to increase accessibility um, in the community for people with disabilities. 
And to do that, uh, to really take advantage of everything our cities or, you know, state or country, world, what have you, um, offers, um, you have to have money to do so, which means employment. And so that's why I wanted to push that as much as I could. Um, and it's something that is so important in our society, and it's often the last group that's looked at. And um, as I go through some of my examples that I encountered, I just want everyone to keep in mind that it's so much more prevalent than you probably realize. Um, because looking at the statistics, you know, at by the end of grade school, so when people are graduating high school, at least 11% of those um, young people um, have a disability already. Then when you move to uh, the college age years, so between like 18 and 23 or so, uh, one in 10 will acquire disability. And then when you get into the work years of uh, 24 to 65, uh, one in three people will acquire disability. So uh, more than likely, you know many people who have disabilities, uh, but many do not disclose. Many don't look at themselves as having a disability because of the type it is, you know, they might have um, uh, diabetes. Well, if they're dependent on insulin um, to live, they have an ADA approved, you know, disability. Um, they could have severe asthma. You know, there, there's all these different things. They're not just the uh, visible disabilities that uh, we generally, as a society, look for. You know, um, a lot of us think, you know, only somebody using a wheelchair, uh, maybe somebody uh, who is using crutches and mobility is obviously an, a challenge for them. You might label them as having a disability. If somebody has a white cane, um, you might understand that they're visually impaired or blind. Uh, but our, there are so many more disabilities out there. And um, many of which, you know, you would never know. And um, you may not have to know in the employment situation, but um, it, it's important that you're trying to accommodate people across the board because what you do for one person generally helps everybody else. Just like when uh, they started mandating putting in ramps, you know, um, to uh, have somebody in a wheelchair be able to access a building. Well, everybody in, and their, you know, I was going to say their dog, um, some, yeah, service animals, uh, but uh, anyone with a stroller, anyone with uh, a rolling bag or, you know, luggage, what have you, everyone's using those ramps now. And so what is good for one group, you know, the people with disabilities often translates to a universal impact. Um, let's see here. Now, uh, when I had started my business, I called it More Access Solutions because I was trying to create more access, literally, uh, for everyone. And um, I think that I actually started it 10 to 15 years too early because the DEI movement was just beginning. And really the focus was on making more gains in hiring women and people of color. And so um, disability was always the last and sometimes still is the last group that is discussed. And so, as an advocate, I'm trying to, you know, change that. Um, in order to help change the dynamic in that conversation, I decided that my business was going to be a for-profit because um, I wanted to elevate the conversation around disability because we are not a charity, okay? Uh, we want to work. Uh, we want to contribute to our societies. And... Um, Hiring people with disabilities, you know, can help your bottom line. 
um, in a couple different ways. Not only the people that you're hiring um, because they're great workers, but also things that you incorporate into your business can also help your customers. Um, customers not only like seeing people with disabilities working in your uh, facility, what, however it is, uh, but they may need something themselves. Um, and if it's already part of the culture, it just assists them much easier and they're going to have a better image of you. Uh, one example is, um, Let's see here. I was working with a uh, banker uh, and we were just having, it was a presentation I was giving and there were, it was represented by many different um, industries. And uh, this banker was um, talking about how difficult it was because he had been assigned to work with older adults. And he was trying to explain different you know, programs and I don't know, all those financial things <laughs> that I don't know about. Uh, he was trying to describe these benefits and why these seniors should invest and, you know, all this stuff. And he was very frustrated because he couldn't get them to understand. And he was always repeating himself. And, you know, like he didn't understand why they weren't getting it. And so I just, I just talked about, you know, you have to watch the behavior, you know, look at them if they're face to face with you and, you know, kind of understand, you know, are they not getting you because they can't hear you? You know, is it because uh, you need to speak more slowly um, so they can process it? Um, there's a lot of things that go on that if they learn to do that with their coworkers, they can implement the same skill set with customers and hopefully see a much better uh, impact with their uh, with their interactions. Now, in terms of um, like interacting with businesses, you know, I was trying to get into uh, what I would consider the low hanging fruit. You know, the businesses that already had identified themselves as being disability friendly. You know, that they were interested in hiring people with disabilities. So I would go to these disability related conferences where these businesses were actually attending. And so I would network with them and explain what I was trying to do. I would set up all of these, you know, uh, follow up meetings and, you know, try to do projects within their organizations. And now this is going back, you know, way back starting in 2010, 2011 until about 2016. And so I was actually ending up finding a lot of lip service going on. Uh, although the people that were attending uh, these conferences were interested themselves in the area of disability, they were usually representing the ERGs, you know, the work groups um, or uh, sometimes HR departments, but their corporate leaders had not bought into the idea of hiring disabilities. And until, you know, the CEO and the upper level management people buy into it and create a culture that will incorporate it into their plans, you're not going to see any movement on it. So it's really important that you get buy-in uh, from the top down. Um, let's see. Okay, I ran into a lot of businesses that say uh, that they don't have any people with disabilities um, at their place of employment. And I have to say that's probably nearly impossible because there is so many people in our society, you know, you're talking, um, you know, at least 20% of the American population that um, identifies themselves as having a disability. Um, it's a matter of um, the corporate culture possibly not encouraging people to disclose. Maybe people are afraid to do so of uh, fearing that their jobs may be jeopardized or they'll be discriminated or left out of things. So it's really important that that corporate culture really 
is inclusive to everybody. And one of the big issues that I see is that when people are not encouraged to disclose, they try to keep doing the job. And sometimes, you know, with all this downsizing and everything they have, all of a sudden they're getting more and more um, tasks assigned to them. And it gets harder and harder to keep up, or maybe it were things that were kind of outside of the real house in the first place. And because they haven't disclosed, they don't have accommodations in place to help them get that extra workload or the different kind of task done properly. And then it becomes a performance issue. And um, no one with a disability should, uh, you know, be discriminated against if, if they have disclosed and they've, you know, received the accommodations they need, you know, they should be able to do the job like their um, non-disabled peers. So um, just encouraging them, um, you know, to really um, advocate for themselves in the workplace, I think is very important. Okay. Um, let's see, I had another business that um, again had said uh, they can't find anybody uh, to hire with a disability. And so I had to challenge them um, to really think about their uh, process and their approach to um, searching for people with disabilities or any other group for that matter. Um, you have to know if you're actually um, marketing to them. Um, if so, are you doing it you know, in a uh, respectful way, are you, um, it's in an effective way. Um, people, you know, you, you could have a statement in the job uh, posting that just says, you know, people of all abilities encouraged to apply. Um, or you, know, you, can, you can be more specific than that if you want to, but you need to let people know that they are welcome. But then you have to also look at um, other things, and I challenged the um, this person I was talking to to go back and review their website. Okay, what does their website language look like? Is it inclusive? Does it talk about um, their workers or their customers they serve as having disabilities? Is it done so in a positive way? Um, it, does it sound inclusive to everyone that's out there, not just specific segments. And then also look at the images. You know, if you can go to your website and there's not a single image of a person with a visible disability, that says something to someone with a disability. And it's just like if, um, you know, if you're um, a business and you only say your workforce actually is diverse, you know, you have people from different ethnic backgrounds. If they're not displayed prominently in pictures, you know, and you only have a bunch of white males in the pictures on your website, that's going to say a lot to the people who either want to try to do business with you or want to work for you. So you have to look at that. Uh, you have to look at the application process. Is it accessible? If you're doing everything online, is the program that you're using, is it accessible with the technology people with disabilities need to access it? Uh, then you also have to consider why you want to hire people with disabilities. And I always encourage people um, to consider, consider our group, um, and I always include myself among those, uh, because we tend to think outside the box. You know, we've had so many challenges in our lives, and it's usually, you know, the professional life, going through school, our personal lives, just navigating our communities, even inside, inside our own homes. So we've had to come up with things that are uh, not typical to solve our challenges, and they come up daily. So we get used to this, and we're pretty quick, okay? And so you want to... Um, you know, tap into that. Uh, we're very uh, creative problem solvers and um, we're always thinking of 
different ways to navigate, you know, whether it's a process, whether it's, you know, um, getting somewhere or how to do, a, you know, uh, their job function. We're always thinking about how to um, make it easier and more efficient. And so um, it's good to tap into that. Um, also, people with disabilities are highly motivated, obviously. Um, uh, we want to perform well because we are very grateful, you know, for the opportunities that come our way because usually they're very hard fought. You know, we go through a lot more challenges to get those opportunities. And so we don't want to be the best kept secret anymore because we are the largest minority group and we're the most educated minority group. And so we just need the actual opportunities to put those into practice. So whether or not you're taking on interns or maybe apprentices, or you're looking for workers, whether at the part-time or for full-time level, you know, giving somebody with an opportunity uh, with a disability, the opportunity, um, they're going to be very loyal. They're going to work harder than other groups just like women or people of color had to do in the past, we're constantly trying to prove ourselves. And it's a great way for people to just um, find pride in a job well done. Let's see. Um, okay. Um, one, uh, ex I guess I have two quick examples left with employers that I've worked with. One was an international um, company, and they had a group of 25 travel agents that worked for the company that uh, arranged for all the travel, all of the hotel accommodations, and anything people needed to uh, attend a meeting or do a presentation, what have you. And instead of actually talking to the people at, in their business that they knew had disabilities, they hired me <laughs> to come in and tell them how to um, train these travel agents and how to change their processes to incorporate the needs of people with disabilities. So, you know, I did do that. I, you know, helped them figure out ways to ask people what they needed and to help them prepare. So when they got to the airport, they didn't have to, you know, uh, change their seat because of their issues, you know, or their medical device that they had on board, or they didn't have to uh, worry about the hotel because uh, you set it up. So um, if they had to be, they happened to be, um, uh, deaf or um, hard of hearing that, you know, and there was an emergency um, that there would be lights and or somebody knocking at their door, there would be lights um, notifying them that was something was going on, you know, that they didn't have to rearrange their room to get uh, an accessible bathtub. You know, there's all these little things that um, people with disabilities will sometimes face. And it's important that you know, it's done in advance and it makes everything a lot more stress-free and they can concentrate on why they're there instead of they need to find a new hotel because they can't get in because there's only stairs, there's no elevator, <laughs> you know? So um, that's something that um, was very interesting. Um, now the last, very last example, I'll go over real quick. Um, a company had a, approached me because they had actually turned down a blind candidate. And I don't remember the reason why they did not, what they told the candidate why they didn't hire them. But uh, the individual was blind and they had been applying for a content development and like a um, editing position. So they would be writing scripts for newsletters or the website or, you know, doing editing of, different publications and the company couldn't understand how this person would, could do it if they were totally blind. Well, they didn't ask the individual how 
could you perform this particular job? You know, um, they just assumed that it couldn't be done. And so totally, you know, basically blew the person off and they lost what I thought would have been a very good employee. Now, um, there are so many different accommodations out there. And, you know, one of those, um, what uh, the um, resources, the national resources, Ask Jan, um, that is a fantastic um, resource, Jobs at Combination Network. And um, they'll go by different disabilities and give you suggestions for uh, different accommodations. And things like um, making sure the person in this situation had uh, a screen reader, that software that's integrated with their computer system that reads text out loud to them. And so then they can type in whatever they want and, you know, approve it that way. And then the person also would have been able to use a Braille display because they were um, very fluent in Braille. And um, a Braille display is a, a device that you attach to your keyboard. And so what's on the screen can be uh, displayed in Braille on this device. And so oh, they Carrie, can I'm, I'm, go I'm, through. Terry, this is Shelley, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yes. we're running very low on time. So if you could wrap oh, this I up apologize. within the next minute, that's fine. Okay. Oh, sure, no problem. Yeah, but so I just wanted to say um, there's usually always an accommodation if you look into it and ask the individual involved and that's it. If you have any questions, my information is part of the presentation. So contact me. Thank Thanks you. So. Thanks so much, Carrie. I appreciate it. Okay, folks, we are running low on time. So in the chat, I have put my email address. If you have a question, because we're not going to have time to get to um, any uh, questions, but if you will send your question to me, I will forward it to the uh, appropriate panelist and they can answer that for you. But next I wanna introduce uh, Chris Dillon. And Chris is currently an area field disability specialist Midwest with Walgreens and has been with Walgreens for nearly nine years in this role. Chris uh, performs as the key contact uh, and an internal subject matter expert on workforce diversity and inclusion programs, focusing on military veteran and disability outreach in the Walgreens disability programs. Before joining Walgreens in 2016, Chris worked for 10 years for a diverse range of organizations, including Home Depot and Easter Seals. In 2006, Chris retired after 23 years service in the U.S. Army and U.S. Marine Corps. Um, Let's see. Chris was part of Operation, Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom, where he was wounded by an IED ambush in Ramadi, Iraq, in July of 2003. Chris holds a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration and an MBA, both with a Human Resource Management concentration from Colorado Tech University. I will turn it over to you, Chris. Thank you, Shelly. And hi, everybody. I know we're running close on time and Walgreens has got a whole bunch of programs going on. So without trying to kill the, the interpreters, <laughs> I'm going to uh, quickly run through a lot of our programs, what we're doing now. Um, as you know, back in 2007, Walgreens had a program that started in our distribution centers that was called the Transition Work Group Program. And that program was designed for a person with a disability to be trained as a general warehouse person in any of the Walgreens distribution centers. And the program first started out in Hartford, Connecticut and uh, Anderson, South Carolina. With the success of that program, somebody had asked the question as to, can we do this in the stores? In October, 2010, the Ready program was piloted in Houston, Dallas, and New York. And I don't think there were a lot of people expecting a lot of success with that program, but uh, they were wrong. Uh, the program was extremely successful and it continued to run before long before I joined Walgreens. Um, and then uh, when I did join Walgreens in February of 2016, um, I got handed the 
the Ready Program, which is the Retail Employees with Disabilities Initiative, our uh, retail store program. And I, one of the first things I noticed is it wasn't all inclusive. Um, the way the program was set up is if I had three agencies bidding on a location to train in one store, I could only select one. Um, then I asked the question, if I select the one, what happens to the rest of the candidates? They don't get a chance. So that bothered me enough to where I got rid of the requirements, uh, made it open to all stores, tried to get as much communication out to the stores as I possibly could, said everybody is eligible to do this. Um, the amount of people where I also didn't like the fact that I was selecting the candidates didn't seem right to me. Um, so I put that back on the job, uh, the, the agencies, the job coaches, they were selecting the candidates that they thought it, they would be a good fit for retail. Let's give them a, let's give them a chance. The program was uh, back then designed mainly to help the agencies and uh, transition programs to help people uh, for training in retail, as well as with our uh, transition work group program for the DCs. Over time, I got the store managers involved and heard some of their ideas. And I talked to a lot of job coaches across the country and they voiced their opinions. Um, luckily, I am one of those type of people that if I didn't want to hear the answer, I wouldn't ask the question. And both sides let me have it. And I'm grateful for that. What I've done after that was store managers make the final call. We've had uh, programs like where the program was just ready, was just a training program. Well, now ready is a train to hire program. The store manager will have a final call on whether or not they want their they're going to be able to hire this candidate. And if the store manager does decide to hire this candidate, I can send that store manager a link for the candidate to, to, to apply through. It'll go to the Walgreens careers page. They type in the requisition number or the job number of that open customer service associate position. Uh, the candidate fills out the application, bypasses the assessment. The uh, candidate completes a background check, uh, drug screening, and we get a brand new team member. And can I can I interrupt you just for a second? Sure, sure, sure. Um, for our um, um, sign language interpreters, are you uh, able or willing to stay an extra fifteen minutes to one fifteen so sure. that Chris can slow down his presentation and and, and do that? Is that sure. possible? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, and what we've done there, I wasn't satisfied with what was completed there. And it seemed like we were missing more candidates, more potential candidates. So I started talking with schools, special education programs, transi uh, transition programs for the 18 to 22-year-old groups. And come to find out that the only reason they didn't want to really be part of the program, they would love to be, but it was the time. They didn't... They didn't feel, you know, what if they needed more time? So I listened. It started with a school in Pennsylvania. I got an entire special education class enrolled in a ready program across three stores in a town in Pennsylvania. There were 17 candidates. And at the end of the school year, Walgreens hired 15 of them at the end of the training. Uh, there was obviously there had to be a schedule um, an accommodation made for scheduling because a lot of the candidates that we had just hired were still required to go through transition training um, because of the state of Pennsylvania. We happily accommodated. But the fact that I found out that we could make this work in the school and the word got out quick, the next thing I knew, I was partnering with 13 other schools across the country on how to make this work and how to get this incorporated into their school programs. Um, over that time, uh, the program really grew. Um, my press or my colleague at the time was uh, Mark Senya, who was running the transition work group program for the DCs, started seeing how flexible the Ready program had become and started doing the same thing with the distribution centers across the country. 
And he saw growth in the involvement and enrollment of candidates coming through our programs. And over time, uh, Walgreens had progressed and we decided that uh, they created a micro fulfillment center, which is a automated prescription refill center, like a prescription DC. And it services a certain amount of stores in the areas across the country. It's still um, well, I, I, it pretty safe to say I don't think it's a pilot program anymore. But uh, it's actually working out really well for the stores. And Mark had thought, why can't we do another program within our micro-fulfillment centers? So in 2022, Mark ran three pilot programs in three different locations in our micro-fulfillment centers. Uh, the first two were uh, Tolson, Arizona and Denver, Colorado. And the other one was in Massachusetts. I kind of wasn't paying attention to that one because I wanted to see how Denver and Tolson were going to do. Even though it was initially the same program, there were two different ways of how they got the job done. And that's what I was paying attention to. Um, it kind of fit into what I was doing with the ready program where Modifying, you know, modifying schedules, getting the job coaches involved and talking with store managers to determine their start dates, to determine their training during the week. Um, cash register. How are they going to do the training on the cash register? Um, I took the advice of over 150 store managers across the country on how we're going to do that and how we did it and how we're still doing it. Um and then just hearing from the site directors from the MFCs on how we're doing this. And soon afterward, uh, they created what is called now the field disability team, which is thankfully I'm on and I don't have to work the ready program all by myself for all the stores nationwide. 8,000 stores is a little bit too much. So I'm quite happy with my 27, 2,700 and 48 stores I have right now, two micro fulfillment centers and two distribution centers. So it's what they're doing now with the programs is MFC had become uh, flexible quickly. Um, the job, the program is uh, designed to train a person to be a fulfillment specialist within the micro fulfillment centers across the country. And like I said, we noticed the differences early. Um, one of these differences, I'm going to be working with uh, Carrie and one of her colleagues, Michelle, here in the next few weeks for uh, in our Bolingbrook location. That's a whole different category, which brought the uh, raised some signs with the rest of the field disability team. And there's Carrie, don't want to scare you off, but all eyes are going to be on us on this one. But currently now um, I've got three candidates going through the Liberty, Missouri uh, fulfillment center. Uh, it looks like two of them are going to get a job offer and it's, uh, it's actually looking really good. Uh, there had been, uh, certain things that a lot of these MFCs are learning as to, um, mainly the jobs themselves. Some, uh, currently right now I have one candidate that's in a wheelchair, but the candidate can do seven of the eight um, tasks of a fulfillment of the uh, fulfillment specialist. So we're relooking that as is it necessary that they do they have to be able to do all the tasks or we good at doing these and they can still be successful. And what she is proving right now, she's very successful and we're not and she's not giving up on those tasks she's had difficulty with. She's still trying. And for that, we extended her several times. We just got done extending her again. If I got to do it again, I'll do it again. But she's learning. And at the same time, so is Walgreens. And with what we're learning at that Liberty DC, Denver, Tolson, and some of our other open D, uh, uh, micro fulfillment centers are all learning the same lessons. So now we're re-asking everything. Um, when I spoke with Carrie and Michelle about the Bolingbrook Micro Fulfillment Center, 
there is a different twist that is on this microfilm center that's not being faced in the others right now. By the state of Illinois, in order to work in this microfilm center, you have to be able to get a pharmacy technician license within two years of being hired. Now, naturally, we already know, and I know because I work at Walgreens, I know that Walgreens is going to help them get their license. The classes, uh, the mock tests, and they're going to help them out in getting that, getting the licenses. What we're looking at now, um, some of the things that I went back and did some research on, is that if we've got a candidate that gets hired, and since they're not going to be called fulfillment specialists at this location, they're going to be called pharmacy technicians. So the pharmacy technicians at this location, are they going to be held to the same standards as the pharmacy technicians in our stores? And once I got the verified that, yes, they are. Now I've got interchangeable, uh, interchangeable positions. If the candidate does not want to stay at the microfilment center, we, we need pharmacy techs across the country as well as pharmacists. So this opened up a whole bunch of doors for us, which is we've got the other field disability specialist of the West, the East, and the South paying very close attention to what is happening here. Um, once we found, uh, once Carrie, myself, Michelle, Sharina, and Lenard figured this all out, which we're hoping here in a couple of weeks it's going to happen, we should be able to get our first candidates coming through the state of Illinois which is, to me, is going to be awesome. I can't wait for this to happen. Um, other ones, the READY program is still open across the state of Illinois. Um, the one thing with the, with uh, READY that we're looking at is we still need job coaches, as well as we still need job coaches for the uh, transition work group program. But we are becoming flexible on those job coaches. Once again, leave this to me and... Uh, had to find another way to do something in the state of Wisconsin. We have uh, a distribution center in Windsor, Northeast uh, Madison. And at that location, we have a job coach. And since uh, we don't have an agency that can do job coaching uh, for that distribution center, Walgreens brought in a, uh, a training coordinator. So the training coordinator does the training of a person with a disability to be trained as a general warehouseman. Jamie, our trainer, took it upon himself to take seven candidates that were considered, that are being considered as direct hire from the state of Wisconsin, Volk Rehab, and put them in different departments in training to see which department would they be the best one at. So not only did we bring them on and get paid to go through this, but we're also kind of treating this as a training and a working interview all at the same time. And as it turns out, this program had become, um, we, found out, uh, we found out how flexible we could be within some of our distribution centers. We had one candidate due to um, medical appointments requested an accommodation halfway through the training for a flexible schedule because of the medical appointments. The distribution center was able to accommodate. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to begin to lie to anybody about this. I am very surprised the DC was able to do that with a flex schedule because uh, this distribution center oversees 10 States and every store within those 10 States. So it's, it's constant operations, but they were able to do it. And they not only did it once, they did it several times and they're still doing it now. Um, out of the seven candidates that we've had go through this program, we hired six of them. We were going to hire the seventh one. The seventh one decided he wanted to go to work at Amazon. Okay. We'll get him back sooner or later. We'll get him back. But the fact that um, the candidates all got jobs after this and given an opportunity that they may have never gotten anywhere else, that means a lot. With uh, READY, we've got the same programs going on. The program is, has become extremely flexible. Um, 
we ask that job coaches over time, if uh, agencies are doing this, and since um, I'm a big fan of uh, independent training, that the job coach, when you start out, let the job coach start phasing out and let's see how the candidate does on their own. And if something happens, how fast can we get the job coach back? And does it make, you know, does it make the candidate feel bad? And maintain the integrity, the dignity of the candidate. And if that, and if the store manager says, you know, I think they're going to be a great hire, Chris, can I extend a couple more weeks? The only thing I come back and tell the store manager is that you're the store manager. I said, I might work up at corporate, but I'm not going to tell you how to run your store. I tell this to the job, the job coach agencies. I said, you guys are the professionals. You guys are the, you guys have the licenses. You have the experience. You know, your candidates far better than I will. I'm just here to kind of knock down some barriers. Let's get them in the stores. Let's get them training. Let's get them in the distribution centers. Let's get them in the micro fulfillment centers. One of the other questions that we had faced a lot was, you know, well, if a candidate is not selected or not recommended, can a candidate go back through the program again? I said, sure. I caught a lot of uh, heat from a lot of, from people that were much higher than me within the company because I said that. And the reason I said that is because when everything was, everything is said and done, I just responded back to them and said, there is no way that you guys could have gotten into the positions that you're at right now. The board of directors, the chief uh, human resource officer, the chief executive officer, chief operations, the C-suite, senior, senior VPs, executive VPs. And I said, there is no way you could have gotten to where you've gotten to right now without somebody giving you another chance. And I said, that's what we do. We give them another chance. We don't want to make somebody feel bad that, you know, everybody knows failure can be seen as a negative thing. You know, I've done this, you know, I can't do this. I can't do this. I failed. I'm not even going to try. Well, maybe my background in the military comes back and comes back to remind these job coaches. It'll come back to remind the state reps, come back to remind the stores. I was an army drill sergeant for three and a half years. And I will say, yes, I was pretty ruthless, pretty nasty. People hated me. That was part of the job. But I took some of that same mentality to come back to tell not only my recruits, you're not going to get anywhere by quitting. Other people rely on you to be able to do your job. Try it again. If they failed, do it again and do it again and do it again. Well, the same thing. I hold with the candidates and the job coaches. There has got to be another way. If a candidate can't do it this way, I said, I'm, I'm not trying to insult the job coach. What about a different job coach? People learn different ways. And if I have a candidate that come, has to come back through any of these programs, um, if I'm able to, for, for ready, it's rather easy different store, different job coach. Um, for the DCs and our micro fulfillment centers, maybe a different job coach, maybe a different schedule. And let's try it. But the one thing I, I don't want is, my biggest fear, I think, is the candidate quitting on themselves. Knowing that I want it, I want it to be inclusive. I want the people that this person the candidate is working with to learn not only some social skills, but to learn that you can be trusted to learn that you are part of this team. You're one of us now. And you know that you're not going to be alone. And that's one of the things that it's not only what I strive for, it's what our whole team strives for. Um, I apologize for not having any, uh, any slides? We did have some slides, but they just got pulled because now they have to be updated. It is looking like now uh, we're trying to get our uh, our titles changed from field disability specialists over to field inclusion specialists and start, pay, uh, start picking up veterans programs for Walgreens nationwide. 
So me being the only veteran on the team, I'm going to be a little busy trying to create uh, cultures and uh, helping them out, make the coordinations with uh, Veterans Affairs, uh, veteran readiness and employment, and uh, as well as maintaining contact with all our VR partners in every state that we deal with across the country. So it's uh, it's an ongoing thing. It's constant change. Um, our my team right now is already having a meeting on something that's about to change, and I'll get the update here probably in about twenty minutes. But uh, it's it's constant change. It's constant flexibility. And if you got questions, you got ideas, feel free. I mean, I'm I'm right here. I'm looking forward to like Carrie already realized that. Michelle's realizing that. Um, let's see what we can do. Um, Shelly? Well, we have uh, uh, Tara dropped your email uh, address in the chat um, for people to reach out to you to get more information. I looked at a website that was pretty thorough about your programs. Is that website under construction or for reconstruction right now? Or can re they still reconstruction? Okay. Okay. That's good. Good to know. So we did some, we did some changes up here. Uh, my department was, uh, we were a standalone department, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Well, now we got, uh, we just got put in into uh, talent management. So we're going to be yeah. with uh, talent management, talent acquisition. Okay. All right. Well, Chris, thank you so much. Uh, I want, yeah, thanks. I want to thank all of our presenters. Um, remember that the recording of this webinar will be available on our website, um, probably within the next three business days. And when we, uh, as we get slides from people, if they had slides for their presentation, we will be uh, emailing them out to everyone uh, that was signed up for the webinar. And again, I want to thank you all for your time um, and patience with us <laughs> today. But uh, I, it was a fantastic webinar. So uh, guys, have a, a wonderful rest of your day. I appreciate you. Bye-bye.